Okay, tonight we're going to look at Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 22. I want to talk to you about extraordinary miracles. Um, and uh, I, would, I would almost pronounce the word extraordinary. Not extraordinary, but extraordinary miracles. And I also want to take just a little bit of time to talk to you about the supremacy of the power of God over all other spiritual powers in this world. We're going to take a second to, to kind of discuss that tonight. And then as we pray tonight, we're going to, we're going to pray about those things uh, tonight when we have prayer time. And I'm, I'm going to actually just suggest that for some of you in the room tonight, um, because I don't preach on this topic often, this may be an opportunity for you to make some decisions and some commitments tonight at prayer time. That would be life-altering, life-changing commitments. And I want to challenge you to make these commitments with your church family. And make those commitments. They're going to make them publicly, lovingly, uh, with one another, and with one another's encouragement, love, and help tonight. And so I'm going to give you guys a few challenges. Uh, and we're going to just follow the challenges that the believers in, in Ephesus were given as they encountered these things that we'll talk about tonight. So we're in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 22. In this particular portion of the book of Acts, the ministry of Paul is in Ephesus. Uh, the ministry in Ephesus in this town, if you flip your outline over, everybody do that real quick. Let me, you're like, what, some of you are like, what is Ephesus? Um, Ephesus is an old Roman city. And if you look at the, the two maps on the back, it's, it's uh, look at the top map. In the red area here that says Asia, uh, that is modern-day Turkey, and um, on the uh, southwest corner is a place called Ephesus. It's marked with a red dot. There's a red line going into it, and there's a red line going out of it. That's the city of Ephesus. The archaeological remains of Ephesus are present today in southwest Turkey, and if you go to Turkey, you can visit this ancient Roman city. Uh, there are pictures of it online if you want to see what it looks like. Uh, in ancient times, the city... Um, was on the coast, but the ancient ruins are just a couple miles from the seashore now because the terrain has changed so drastically. And so now, um, if you visit the ancient remains of Ephesus, you're about a mile or so away from the Mediterranean coast. But when you look at the remains, you can see the leftovers of the old bay that has been filled in with silt over the last 2,000 years, and you'll see why the coast changed. You guys know what I'm talking about? Sometimes terrain changes. And uh, so it's, it's a real city um, in the ancient Roman world. It was an important city in this region. It was kind of like the primary city in Southwest Asia. All the other cities around it were a little bit smaller. Um, it was a cultural center. It was a trade center because it had a really nice, natural, deep bay, which I said has filled in with silt. That natural, nice, deep bay made it an easy place for ships to come in and out of. And so Ephesus was a super popular place uh, 2,000 years ago. And Paul, in one of his missionary journeys, comes to Ephesus. He, he visits Ephesus just briefly on his way home in his second missionary journey. Now he's on his third missionary journey and he's heading out and he stops in Ephesus. And we're gonna find out that he stops for quite some time. So the ministry that he begins there is described in Acts chapter 19, verses one through seven. The foundation of that ministry is with a Jewish community. Why does God start with the Jewish community? Because the Jewish people knew the Old Testament. And let me remind you that when you pick up your Bible to read God's word, that this much of it is Old Testament, and this much of it is New Testament. Two-thirds of your Bible, two-thirds of God's Word is Old Testament. And all the people that Paul went to minister to first were people who knew the Old Testament, had the Old Testament in their hands. They read the Old Testament scriptures in their Jewish synagogues week by week, and Paul would go minister to those people that knew all the promises of the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus in the New Testament. Is everybody with me tonight? Is that a good illustration? Just show it to you on a Bible. Even if you're watching online, you can see that it, it matters to know the Old Testament. And so the foundation of the church starts with these Jewish people. And um, it also starts with Holy Spirit empowerment. Look in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. There's some people with some Jewish background. They have some information about John the Baptist. But then when they learn about Jesus, they're also empowered by the Holy Spirit. The foundation was a Jewish community, a small band of believers in John the Baptist or followers of John the Baptist, and also a group of people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. People who were getting ready to face great gospel opposition. 
Great gospel opposition on the way. So they needed the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's two forms of opposition that show up in this story, in this part of the Bible. One is Jewish rejection of the gospel, and we'll read about that in just a second. And then the other form of opposition is the occult that's present in, in Ephesus. And we're going to focus on that a little bit tonight. We're going to focus on the occult. Christianity faces the full force of the Greco-Roman false religious practices in Ephesus. Christianity faces the full force of Greco-Roman false religious practices in Ephesus. This is why Paul spends such a long time in the city and why Luke spends a lot of time describing the ministry in Ephesus. A little bit in Acts 18, most of Acts chapter 19, there's a lot of information about Ephesus. Next week, we're going to see that the gospel is not only opposed by culture and by the occult and religious practices in the town, but then it is next going to be opposed economically and culturally. And there's some economic opposition to the gospel. And Pastor Steve's going to share a message with you next Wednesday night about that. That's going to be really cool. You do not want to miss that because God has an economic plan as well as a spiritual plan. Isn't that good news? How many of you love economics? Economics can be fun, right? And I'm just telling you, God, God cares about economics. Does he own a cattle on a thousand hills? Yeah. Does he provide for you? Yeah, did, did Ecclesiastes say that money's the answer for everything? <laughs> That's a tricky verse of scripture, but it's there. It's like God, sometimes uh, God has the answer in, in his provision for you, and so economics matters, and we're going to look at a little bit of that next, next Wednesday night. The good news is that the truth and the power of the gospel always prevails over attacks. Let me tell you, say that again. The truth and the power of the gospel always prevails over attacks. You guys with me today? How many of you have been watching the news? Now I'm going to break from my notes just a second. We're going to pray for a moment. How many of you have been watching the news in regard to Israel? Can I remind you of a, a word from Jesus? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on all the things that we could talk about. We're going to pray for Israel, but I want to remind you of a promise, a word from Jesus. Jesus was Jewish, right? He wasn't American. Uh, I don't think Jesus was, um, he wasn't like a, a Caucasian guy like me. He was probably more like a, a Middle Eastern guy because Jewish people are, are Semites. Uh, that's a long story. Anyway, uh, so, but listen. Jesus said this. Jesus said the city of Jerusalem would be trampled upon for the entire times of the Gentiles. For the entire time of the Gentiles. That the holy city would be trampled upon. And can I tell you something? That's been going on since 70 AD. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the city and they tore down Herod's temple. It's the last time there was a temple to worship in in Jerusalem. And then in 135 AD, Hadrian destroyed it again, the Emperor Hadrian. And he, built, he rebuilt it and gave it a different name. He didn't even call it Jerusalem. Uh, it's been trampled upon, hasn't it? In uh, 600 something AD, the, uh, the Muslims took over the pa area of, uh, of Palestine and, and the Levant, and, um, and they built the Dome of the Rock in the place where the temple used to be. And it's still there today in the center of Jerusalem. Get on Google Maps, you can go find it and look at the top of it from the sky. <laughs> it's really there. It's not imaginary, it's a real place. Uh, the Bible is rooted in history, reality, and geography. You guys with me tonight? And so the gospel matters, it's truth, and Jesus said that that city and that region was going to be trampled on during the time of the Gentiles. Well, we're still living in the time of the Gentiles. What is God up to during the time of the Gentiles? Well, he's up to giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the nations of the world who aren't Jewish. That's us, the Gentiles. Where did the gospel go first? Well, we're going to see in just a few seconds, we read Acts chapter 19, the gospel went to the Jew first, but then it went to the Gentiles. And as we pray for Israel, here's what I want you to recognize. I want God to, to do what he needs to do uh, with, his, with his people, the Jewish people that he's made so many biblical promises to. But can I tell you something? I want God to do what he wants to do in the Gentiles. Because right now, it's the time of the Gentiles. And God is saving Gentiles all over the world. People from every language, every tribe, every ethnic group, every nation. Isn't that good news? We're all, we're all welcome to come to the cross. 
And in the midst of all this trouble, if there's one thing that I want to do with my time and with my life, I just want to present Jesus to people. I want to present Jesus to people. I want to present Jesus to people. A friend of mine put a post on Facebook this week. He's a pastor friend of mine in St. Louis. He just got retired a year or so ago. He put a little meme up. It said, the world's preparing for a war. Heaven's preparing for a wedding. The world's preparing for a war. Heaven's preparing for a wedding. Jesus is coming again soon. And when he comes again soon, when he returns, it'll be the end of the time of the Gentiles. And until that time, I'm going to pray for Israel. I'm going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell people about Jesus because that is the plan of God for today. Is everybody with me? Uh, so let's stand to our feet. Let's take a second. Let's pray for that uh, very thing right now. Heavenly Father, we join together as a church. And Lord, we want to pray um, for Israel. We want to pray for the the city of Jerusalem, the place where you said uh, you would put your name for all time. And Father, we pray, God, for peace. Lord, we remember the words of Jesus. He said the city would be trampled upon during the time of the Gentiles, but he also said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I have longed to gather you to myself like a hen gathers her chicks. And Father God, I pray that not only would Gentiles be saved during this time of the Gentiles, not only would you help us, Father God, help people find and follow Jesus, not only would you help us support missionaries and help us reach our friends and neighbors, God, this is our time. This is our time, Lord, to, to share the gospel and to give life to people. For you, Lord, to use us to give life to people. But Lord, I pray that in the midst of these days, Lord, that uh, people all around the world, in the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of this conflict, they would see that Jesus, that uh, this character that lived 2,000 years ago went by the name of Yeshua, his name means salvation. God, that people would recognize that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he is salvation. And Father God, we pray for peace today. We pray for peace so that the gospel will spread. We pray for peace so that lives will be saved. We pray for peace so that people from every tribe, every ethnic group, every nation would see that Jesus is good, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is loving, Jesus is the way. God, would you work that out today, even in the midst of trouble. We pray for people who are grieving today, people who are hurting today, and uh, we pray that you would comfort them and help them. God, we pray that uh, you would accomplish your will and we pray for the peace of that city, Jerusalem, and for the nation of Israel today. Give your help. Lord, we uh, thank you that you hear us when we pray. And I believe, God, that you'll bless us uh, when, when we uh, bless your people. And God, you'll bless us when we pray. You'll bless us when we care about more than just ourselves. Would you help us to do that? In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's read Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 8. Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 8. Paul's in, in Ephesus, the city, and the Bible says that Paul entered the synagogue. That's the place where Jewish people worshipped in Ephesus. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, that's a long time for Paul, isn't it? Some places he only went for three months, and they kicked him out of the synagogue like week number two. Right? We've seen that over and over again in some of the other stories from the book of Acts. But here they let him speak for three months. But then some became obstinate, so the opposition begins to rise up, and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The way was the group of people who were choosing Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as Savior. They're becoming Christians. So Paul left them, and he took the disciples, the people who followed Jesus, with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Um, we don't know if Tyrannus was the guy that owned the lecture hall or if Tyrannus was the primary speaker in a rented lecture hall. It's one of those two things. And uh, typically what would happen is uh, the Greeks would have their lectures in the morning and then everybody would go to work. But then the lecture hall is probably empty all afternoon and all evening. And so Paul used it in the off times. That's probably what was going on there just culturally. Okay, num verse number 10 says, this went on. So Paul speaks in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. How long was he in Ephesus? Two years and three months at that point. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. 
Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that uh, had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man, the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked. Everybody say naked. And bleeding. That's embarrassing, right? So he said, naked's in the Bible? It's in the Bible. Verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I've got to visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the promise of Asia a little longer. So let's look at some of the parts of this real quick and uh, look at extraordinary miracles and what God was doing here. Number one, in the first paragraph, verse 8 through 10, we see the primacy or the importance of preaching. What did Paul do for most of the time that he was in Ephesus? He spoke and preached the word. He spoke and preached the word. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So look at your map on the back. See that place that's red in the middle of the map? That huge chunk of southwest Turkey? That's Asia. The whole province heard about the word of the Lord because the gospel went out from Ephesus. Does everybody see what we're talking about? That's a big region. And not only did the whole province hear the gospel, churches were planted out of the church in Ephesus. And later in the book of Revelation, God, Jesus gives uh, seven messages to seven churches in Asia. They're all churches that probably came out of Ephesus. And they're all in that red area, the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. So preaching is primary. Miracles... We're going to look at some miracles, but miracles point to Jesus. Jesus, or preaching makes Jesus clear. Let me rephrase, let me say that again. Pre, pre, miracles point people to Jesus, right? But preaching makes Jesus clear. Like people, people will experience miracles and they'll be like, oh, God did something. And they could imagine all kinds of things about what God did and why God did it and what happened and did I cause it? Did somebody else cause it? I mean, their superstitions could go anywhere with a miracle. Am I right? But preaching makes Jesus clear. I want miracles. But with miracles, there's got to be preaching who Jesus is, and how God worked, and what God worked, and what he did. Is everybody with me? Otherwise, there can be all kinds of miracles and just absolutely false superstitions that follow them. And that's one of the things that's happening a little bit in Ephesus. We're going to address that in just a moment. Romans 10 verse 14 says, How can people call on the word one they have not believed in. How can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one in whom they've never heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Preaching is essential. Let me tell you something, church. I want to see God do more miracles. Miracles are fun, right? But listen, we need, we need Christians who tell people the truth about Jesus we got to speak up and just tell people the truth about Jesus. Give people God's word, the story of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. People need the truth of who Jesus is. Is everybody with me tonight? So salvation comes by faith in Jesus, not faith in miracles. Isn't that right? 
Salvation comes by faith in Jesus, not faith in miracles. Even when Jesus is the one given the miracle, right? And aren't you glad that Jesus gives miracles? We're Pentecostal people. I just preached a message a few weeks ago. We're Pentecostal people. Pentecostal people expect miracles. Amen? Amen. We expect miracles. I've got faith for miracles. I've got faith that God will give us miracles of healing. I've got faith that God will give us miracles of provision. Sean, you want to tell your story? Now's a good time. And so I'm going to have Sean come up here, and I'm going to borrow uh, Kent's microphone. And so get on up here right beside me, Sean. I'm going to have him share just a quick testimony of God's help. Well, we, all, we all have storms we go through. We need to praise him through those. That's, that's one thing that's tough to do sometimes. But uh, a couple weeks ago, shoulder was hurting um, right before men's retreat. It was starting hurting pretty bad. Last Wednesday night, well, went to men's retreat bashed a van. It was kind of fun. We had that was fun. That was fun. But I tore my shoulder up even worse. That oh, night. no. So uh, Wednesday night, I came to church. I was going to come anyway, but I really came up. I'm going to get healed tonight. The Lord's going to heal me. I need. I, I don't have time for that because we uh, have a whole other story in a second. But Pastor Stephen came up and uh, prayed for me, prayed for him. He prayed for me. And I'm like, I, I want to be healed right then. Instant. We all do. I went to work. It had hurt worse. Um, through the night, but halfway through the night, it started feeling better. Didn't even really realize it, and it started starting feeling a lot better. So the next day, no pain at all. I mean, I can lift my arm. It was it was popping, cracking. I thought I tore something in there, like uh, you know, rotator cuff or something. But Lord healed it. I, was, I told the Lord that night, the whole night I'm praying to work. I ain't got time for this. I, yeah. I, know I told him straight up, I don't have I don't have time for this. Please heal me because uh, <laughs> one thing we had to move Hannah back. Her husband husband went divorce, so she's moving back in with us taking care of her, loving her. And so you guys just pray, pray for her. But uh, that's a whole other situation. It's going well. But the Lord Lord healed me. I mean, Praise I know we God. did because it was hurting so bad. Just even to sit riding up there, that six-hour drive was hurting oh. so bad. And now it's, it's perfect. So Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. And thank, thank you for praying for me and pray for Hannah. But, hey, keep praying. Praise Absolutely. The storm. It's awesome. He can heal you. He can. Did it that's for me. right. That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. So we trust God for miracles. I believe God for miracles. But listen, people need Jesus. Amen? And we got to make it clear. Let's trust God for miracles, but let's not get off track and have people trusting in miracles rather than the miracle giver, the life giver, the Savior. Amen? It's primacy of preaching. Then I want you to see something interesting. In verse 11, the Bible says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. In the New Living Translation, it says God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. So here's the, tr- here's the big question. What's the difference between an, uh, an unusual miracle and a usual miracle? What's a usual miracle? <laughs> well, let's look at this and kind of figure out what t- why Luke would categorize some miracles as extraordinary or unusual. So it's kind of a strange thing for Luke to say. The Greek word for handkerchiefs used here so that some handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched Paul were taken to sick people and all their illnesses occurred. The, the word handkerchief means work rag. So when you think handkerchief, you're like, you know, a man might pull a handkerchief out of the front pocket of his tuxedo and hand it to a lady who might have a tear in her eye. It's that kind of handkerchief, right? No, 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 no. I want you to think about a man that works leather all day and makes tents with leather, and he's probably working in a shop outdoors with a dirt floor, and he's punching holes in leather, and he's sewing heavy pieces of animal hide together, and he grabs his work rag, and he wipes the filthy sweat off his grimy face and tosses it to the side. That's, that's a handkerchief in the Greek. It's not a handkerchief. It's a <laughs> handkerchief. Is everybody with me today? And uh, so he... It's, it's handkerchiefs. Now do you see why the next description is aprons? What's the artisan wear while he's working? The apron. And what's he doing? He's wiping his hands on it. He's wiping his leather knife on it. It's, they're probably kind of filthy and dirty. It's, it's not what we think of like, oh, my grandma had an apron and she would buy it when she made apple pie. No, it's not that kind of sweet apron. It's, it's probably more like the apron that Kent wears when he's shoeing horses. Okay, it's probably that kind of apron. And um, so you got to see that like people were 
kind of grasping at straws. They were believing for something very unusual when someone went and got one of Paul's filthy work aprons or sweaty rags and took it to a sick person. Why would they even do that? That doesn't even make sense. And the way it's worded, if you read it carefully, just understand the way it's worded, Paul probably didn't know that someone took his work rag. It wasn't like Paul said, if you'll send me $25, I'll send you a handkerchief that I have prayed for, and you'll have miracles take place when I send you this handkerchief. No, 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 no. There was no promotion. There was no uh, manipulation or creation of a thing. It was more like somebody was like, that's Paul's? I got, a, I got a sick guy, and I've seen some miracles take place down at the Hall of Tyrannus, and I, if I take that rag to that sick person, I wonder if they'd get better. Because that miracle guy, that miracle guy wiped his sweat on it. You guys with me today? It's kind of weird, huh? But that's the way people are thinking. Why did people think that way? Because Ephesus was a town that was consumed with superstitious occultic religion. And because they were consumed with superstitious occultic religion, they would believe, if I could just get that rag, someone might be healed. Isn't that an unusual way for God to choose to work? That would be unusual. Do you see why that's unusual? So then what would be a usual miracle? A usual miracle is when a believer like Sean has a shoulder problem. And he calls for the elders of the church. And Steve goes and prays for him, maybe anoints him with oil. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, James chapter 5, verse 14. That's a usual miracle. You guys see what I'm saying? Let's believe God for some usual miracles. And let's understand that God in his love and his grace may do some unusual miracles. Do you know why I don't pray over napkins and I don't have a napkin ministry? Because that's unusual. And the Bible said it's extraordinary. It's not, it, but, but what does the Bible command me to do? The Bible commands me to call for the elders, anoint someone with oil, and pray. That's a command. That's a usual way. Uh, the Bible says that, that healing is God's children's bread. Okay, that's usual. That's a promise from God. We're going to do that. We're going to trust God for provision and miracles and peace and comfort and trust God that he's going to do some amazing things. So from verse 11 through verse 18, the emphasis is on this fallacy and the inadequacy of magic, the inadequacy of these superstitions that were in Ephesus. Look at the inadequacy of magic. And I got that little title there actually from a, from a, a, a commentary where this whole section in one of my commentaries is, is titled The Inadequacy of Magic. Uh, the, the sorcerers think, well, hey, we're going to go out and drive out evil spirits. They were probably getting paid to do it. Like, oh, man, we'll give you money to get rid of the evil spirits in our house. And so people would pay these uh, seven sons of Sceva, this Jewish high priest, to come and drive out evil spirits. So people would pay them to do this kind of stuff. And uh, they're like, well, you know, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, some things are happening around town. Let's start using the name of Jesus. That sounds like a powerful incantation. And so when they started to invoke the name of Jesus without a relationship with Jesus, the evil spirit speaks up and says, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I've heard about, but who are you? And then beat the tar out of them. Amen? The Greek and Roman world was enamored with magic as part of their paganism. At Ephesus, there was a clash between paganistic cult practice and the power of Jesus. Notice these. Paul's rags are used as healing trinkets. The sons of Sceva are invoking the name of Jesus as some kind of magical incantation. And then... When people are coming to Christ and they're getting saved, they're making confession of their sinful sorcery practices. And they bring their occultic materials together and they burn them all. Do you guys see what's happening here? This is the emphasis of the story in these few paragraphs of Scripture here. It's a confrontation between the occult and the power of Jesus and the power of the gospel. In Acts chapter 5, desperate and undiscipled people placed their sick friends in the street 
hoping that the shadow of Peter might fall on them so that they'd be healed. Did God tell them to place their sick friends in the road so that Peter's shadow might fall on them? They did that out of hope and superstition. It wasn't, there's no command in scripture and we don't make a practice out of it at Lifestream Church. Okay, whoever needs healing, just walk under this shadow here, right? Why? Because we understand in the scripture that people were desperate and they didn't know how to even ask for a miracle. But the point of that passage of scripture in Acts chapter 5 is for us to understand that God was working powerfully through Peter. Not that we should make a doctrine out of shadows. Is everybody with me today? Think clearly as you read some of these stories. It's interesting how God will respond to desperate and ignorant appeals, people that don't know the scripture, that don't know the plan of God, that haven't experienced the life of Jesus, God will, in his grace and mercy, respond to a desperate, ignorant appeal. Here, let me give you a few examples of desperate, ignorant appeals. Well, think of the woman with the issue of blood. What did she say to herself? Jesus was ministering, and she said to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be cured. Is there a command to touch people's garments? No. It was God being gracious in a person's desperate appeal. Um, here, another one is Peter's shadows. Another one is these situations with rags. Here's another one from the Old Testament. So Elisha dies. The Bible says he died of a sickness. And after Elisha died, he was buried. And uh, if it's typical, like 750, 800 BC, he would be buried in a cave. And so Elisha's buried in this cave, and some robbers kill a guy. Well, that's not good. They kill this man to rob him, and then they're like, what are we going to do with the body? And they're like, well, there's a hole in the ground. And so they throw the body in the cave. When the body hits the bones of Elisha, the man comes to life and is raised from the dead. You guys remember that story in the Old Testament? Like, no one even asked for anything, and God did a miracle. What am I saying? It's an unusual miracle, right? There wasn't, there wasn't a group of people who said, I've got faith in God. I'm taking my friend to the guy that knows how to give healing. They threw a dead body in a cave. And sometimes God can do some unusual miracles. As disciples of Jesus... I want you to come to a place where you appeal to God by a relationship of faith and obedience to him. Is everybody with me tonight? That's how I want to encourage you to pray. Pray for big things. Pray for God to do something impossible. But let's pray not out of a hope in magic or good luck or fortune or none of that junk, right? Let's pray because I know the Father through Jesus Christ. I can trust the Father who saved me through Jesus Christ. I can trust my God to help me when I'm struggling and when I'm going through the storm. Amen? Amen. That's the way we want to pray as people who are full of faith. You know, there's a resurgence of paganism today, and the evil spirits that empowered paganism 2,000 years ago are empowering paganism today. Can I remind you of that? The evil spirits that empower the, the religious activity of paganism and occultism today are empowering paganism and occultism today. Every follower of Jesus must reject and repent of all occult and magic arts. Aren't you glad that this is a, this is a good time to preach on this right now, right? Okay. So please do as the believers in Ephesus did. Listen to what the Bible says. What did the believers in Ephesus do? A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and they burned them publicly. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. What grew in power? The word of the Lord. What was being preached? That brings us back to point number one again, doesn't it? So God was doing something cool. So let's, th let's pray about a few things. We're going to invite the musicians to come to the front. We're going to stand to our feet right now and we're going to make some commitments to the Lord tonight. Number one. Number one, everybody in the room, let's put our faith in Jesus. God made you, 
a spiritual being in a spiritual world, right? God made you a spiritual being, and he made you in a spiritual world. Put your faith in Jesus. He is a saving God. He is a loving Savior. Jesus died on a cross for your sins to be forgiven. Amen? How many of you are glad that you know that? How many of you are glad that you've received that? How many of you are glad that you know you're on your way to heaven? It's because of Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Know that your sins are forgiven. Turn to him. He's our source. Number two, let's recognize that there are evil spiritual influences in the world that we need to avoid. Let's recognize there are evil spiritual influences in the world that we must avoid. And number three, let's go to God in prayer and let's find his love and his power and let's find that his love is great. It's great. I mean, it's a powerful, powerful love for us tonight to hear us when we pray and to help us in times of need. It's, it's been a while, but as a pastor, well, it hasn't been a while. I gotta take that back. Um, as a pastor, let me just tell you some cool things I've gotten to be a part of. And so I think it's cool. It's like moments of victory. It's a cool thing when a person gets saved and they show up at church on their third Sunday to ever attend church. They came to church and got saved. They came a second time. They show up the third Sunday with a brown paper bag. What's in the brown paper bag? Some things God wants me to get rid of. Oh, really? Well, what's God want you to get rid of? And this lady named the things, like they literally had names. <laughs> One was named Black Beauty. I was like, Black Beauty's in the paper bag? What is Black Beauty? She's like, it's my bong. She's like, I need to get rid of, I need to get rid of my, my two bongs. God told me to no more of this. Okay. So we took that paper bag and put it on a bench. Uh, we went to the tool room and got a hammer. And we gave Charlene the hammer and said, make him to go away. And she just went. <laughs> and she was done. Just a moment of being set free. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God's still doing that today. Girl came to church after we had given her a Bible. We gave her a Bible eight weeks later. She showed up at church on a Wednesday night, just like this church Bible study prayer. And uh, she gave her heart to the Lord. And she said, I read the whole Bible that you gave me. I was like, oh, that's good. You did better than everybody else in the church. Nobody else read the Bible in eight weeks. She literally read the whole thing. It's crazy what she remembered. That's a long story. And she said, tonight I need to give my heart to Jesus. She's like, I understand it from like, I need to like put my faith in Jesus. That's what the New Testament tells me. I'm like, yep, you got it. You read it right. She's like, yeah, I need to do that. And she's like, and I'm gonna get rid of these. She handed me her tarot cards. She's like, this is how I've been making money. And it's time for me to do something different now. No more, no more magic. No more tarot cards. Hmm. I've had people turn in their Ouija boards, destroy them, burn them. I took somebody's pack of cigarettes one day and submerged it in my cup of coffee. That cup of coffee was done. I'd go back to the coffee bar and get another one. I mean, every now and then, it's just fun to be a part with somebody as, as they just like get rid of the thing that God's asking them to get rid of. You guys with me tonight? And it's exciting, it's joyful. And, and they're following what the Holy Spirit's telling them to do, and, and then sometimes we just get to be a part of it. It's pretty awesome, it's pretty exciting. And so tonight, I just wanna give you this challenge as we're gonna sing this song of Speak the Name of Jesus. Um, man, if there's something in your life, if there's something in your life and you're like, I need to get rid of this, I need to get rid of it, pornography, drugs, occult stuff, Ouija board, tarot cards, um, palm reading instructions and books and junk like that. That's all occultic stuff. You guys with me today? And if it's time for you to get rid of that, 
I want you to, I want you to make the commitment tonight. I'm getting rid of it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a second. I've got some things, Pastor Paul, that I need to get rid of. And, um, and Steve, uh, you're going to help me, Pastor Steve, because um, I think people may bring some things next Wednesday night. You know what I'm talking about. You're in the room and you say, hey, I got some stuff I need to get rid of. Um, and I've been trusting in the wrong power source. It's not from Jesus. And uh, it's time to get rid of that. It's time to get rid of something that, that shouldn't be in my life, whatever that is. And if that's you, you say, I got something I need to get rid of. Hold your hand up and look at me for a second. Thank you. Thank you. I got some things I need to get rid of. Hold your hand up and look at me until I say hey to you. Yeah, hey. Good. Anybody else? They got something, you're like, I got to get rid of this. I got to get rid of it. I want to ask you to make a commitment. You're making the commitment tonight. I'm getting rid of it. All right? Next Wednesday night, um, you will have either already gotten rid of it, burned it, destroyed it. If it's no good for you, can I tell you something? It's probably no good for anybody else either. So don't take it to the resale shop and don't give it to somebody. Just get, make it go away, period. If it's not good for you, it's not good for somebody else either. Is everybody with me tonight? Amen. And God's going to do something so liberating in the lives of the folks that just lifted their hands. God's going to do something so liberating. And um, I want to give you each a challenge. I'm going to give you a challenge. Be here next Wednesday night, and I want you to testify with Steve. Can you lead that testimony service? And, uh, and if you need a trash can or whatever to help get rid of some things, well, let's have a trash can, and we'll get rid of some things. Is everybody with me today? Man, I've been in services like this where people get rid of satanic CDs, pornographic magazines. I mean, I've seen stuff get thrown away that is so good to see go. Amen? Amen. And so let's, let's trust God uh, to, to do these things. Amen? Amen. Father God, uh, tonight I'm praying for victory. There's some people that are making a commitment right now to get rid of some things and to clean some things out of their lives. Father God, I pray that you'd give them the, the, the obedience and the fortitude and the joy to finish it, to finish it, to not put this moment to the side and forget about it. Let this be the moment that changes everything in Jesus' mighty name. If you're in the room tonight and you say, I need to choose Jesus as my Savior. I need to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be saved. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. And Pastor, I want you to pray with me that I'm saved tonight. If that's you, I want you to hold your hand up real quick. And I want to pray with you real quick before we sing this song. I want to be saved. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't see anybody lifting their hands. Here's what I want us to do next. Can we just say, Jesus, I need you over every part of my life. Jesus, I need you over everything. And let's submit it all to him tonight.